Welcome, everyone, and thank you so very much for coming to uh, learn more about the process that the FDA is utilizing to review the current or upcoming COVID vaccines, and also um, from the CDC about the uh, efforts that they are making to ensure equitable distribution uh, in a timely manner. My name is Amy Pisani, and I'm the Executive Director of Vaccinate Your Family. We are an organization that has been in existence almost 30 years now. Uh, we started out as Every Child by Two back in 91. Um, as you may know, former First Lady Rosalind Carter is our co-founder, along with Betty Bumpers, who was the First Lady of Arkansas during um, her time as uh, governor's spouse. And her husband later came to Washington, D.C. as a senator and served in office for almost 25 years himself. So our two founders have been very active. Um, Betty passed away a few years ago. Um, as you may have heard yesterday in the news, several of the former presidents have made a statement that they're planning on um, getting themselves vaccinated against COVID-19 when those vaccines become available. And uh, Jimmy Carter and Rosalind Carter have also expressed their, uh, their support for vaccination of those who are eligible. We, of course, um, are very intimately connected with the process, and Mrs. Carter is very well aware that not everyone will be prioritized first in line, but she wants to support um, the efforts and ensure that there's equitable distribution. It's a passion of hers. She's worked on it since she was a first lady back in the 70s. Um, so we're really excited that today has come. I feel like the holidays are upon us and the vaccines are coming and it's just a whole new, a whole new world. We've been doing a couple of these webinars for the past couple months. And today I just feel just thrilled that we're so close to the finish line. So we're pleased to have the National Consumers League who is co-hosting this event with us. And I'm going to introduce Sally Greenberg who has been with the National Consumers League since 2007. She is the primary spokesperson on a variety of issues, and uh, she would love to welcome many of the guests who have come um, through the invite from the National Consumers League. So Sally. Yeah, thank you so much, Amy, and good morning, everyone. Um, for over 120 years, my organization, the National Consumers League, has worked to improve patient safety and health outcomes and access to vaccines. We've been very strong proponents of vaccines, uh, their safety and their incredible uh, efficacy. Uh, you know, like many consumers, NCL was skeptical uh, that uh, we would be able to see a vaccine at as, um, as quickly as we have now. We were a little bit skeptical of some of the statements that were coming from very high levels of government related to COVID-19 treatments. However, we have been encouraged by the honesty and transparency and truly the level of public engagement uh, the FDA and the CDC have demonstrated throughout the vaccine development process. Uh, NCL has also taken an active role in representing a consumer perspective by presenting testimony to federal vaccine agencies like VERPAC and, and ASIP in support of vaccine confidence. And we have really tried hard to educate consumers on the, uh, this new term, emergency use authorization, at least it's a new term to many consumers, uh, and the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine development process. Uh, we've really emphasized as well the importance of diversity in the clinical trial process as we uh, get closer to being able to uh, distribute this vaccine. So in September, we uh, sat down uh, in a forum very much like this with Dr. Uh, Stephen Hahn to discuss uh, the consumer concerns surrounding the expedited approval process of a COVID-19 vaccine. And Dr. Hahn, it's so great to be with you again and today in this type of consumer engagement. And thank you for making yourself available to, to have these conversations. Um, in September, when we addressed consumer fears about emergency use authorization, um, we our, our, our uh, goal was really to assure the public that the FDA will approve only, um, uh, only a COVID-19 vaccine using a measured evidence-based approach. There has never been a more critical time for consumers to have confidence in the FDA. We've engaged with our stakeholders to support the FDA's efforts to ensure safety and efficacy. And, uh, and that we really need these vaccines to be delivered uh, to consumers in, in, in very short order, but they need to have confidence in the process. Um, to prevent further prevent the spread, of, the spread of the virus. So in terms of safety and effectiveness, we do trust that the FDA will release a vaccine only upon careful consideration of its safety and effectiveness. Um, I know there have been some comparisons to the UK's approval process, maybe on the other side, 
why aren't we getting this uh, out to uh, to patients and and vulnerable populations sooner? We know that we've heard the FD, the uh, the UK is starting their distribution now, and I'd like just to take a moment to highlight the rigorous vaccine approval process and tell consumers why uh, we can uh, trust the safety of that vaccine. Simply put, the UK accepts raw data uh, provided by vaccine manufacturers. The US and the FDA, which is, I think, fair to say the world's gold standard, requires companies to go through two additional steps, one to submit their data to the FDA, and then the, that data, uh, those data are shared uh, with ASIP. And so you've got an an additional two-step process. I know the Wall Street Journal today was asking that question in one of their editorials, and I thought, well, we're gonna be able to address that at our forum this morning. Um, once the vaccine is released, we're calling on the FDA uh, to perform sufficient um, uh, post-market surveillance to determine its ongoing eff efficacy. And additionally, we're recommending a fortified immunization information system infrastructure to help track and adequately marshal vaccine resources. I'm just going to talk briefly about equ equitable distribution of the vaccines from a consumer perspective. Um, the leading candidates for COVID-19 vaccines will require to, uh, or at least the, the companies distributing the vaccines uh, uh, first out of the, out of the box, um, require two doses spaced several weeks apart. And we're gonna be uh, working with our partners and our, our Script Your Future campaign, which is a medication adherence campaign, to ensure consumers understand that process, but also that these vaccines are not interchangeable. Uh, for example, the Pfizer vaccine cannot be used in conjunction with the Moderna vaccine, and this information is going to be essential to uh, consumers. And we agree with recent uh, the recent recommendation that allocates the first vaccine to healthcare workers and long-term care residents. I think the difficult task ahead is really educating the public about how those decisions are made. Um, communities most vulnerable to COVID-19 often face unaddressed uh, social determinants of health that are have led to higher infection rates, particularly in uh, communities of color. So an in initial limited supply of a vaccine is going to, you know, it, it may in fact intensify these inequities. And so we've got to address that. And um, finally, on the issue of diversity, it's imperative that the clinical trials for COVID-19 vaccines uh, have been diverse. Uh, people of color are significantly underrepresented as as noted um, in clinical trials in this phenomenon it will hamper vaccine uptake. And there's a, a lot of skepticism and, and uh, historical resistance um, for a lot of um, uh, complicated reasons. And we as a consumer organization are gonna work very hard to overcome uh, uh, many of those, uh, uh, that skepticism and those concerns. So, um, and we're very pleased that, um, that there has been a real effort in the clinical trials to uh, ensure uh, adequate representation across uh, different uh, demographics and, and uh, communities of color certainly a figure very large in, in that discussion. So um, I will close by just saying thank you uh, for the opportunity to be with you, uh, Dr. Hahn and uh, Dr. Marks and, um, and, and Amy Pisani, who's a longtime friend and has done such wonderful work in ensuring that all uh, kids and all, all of us uh, have access to safe and effective vaccines. Thank you, Sally. Wonderful to hear um, all the great messaging about your community and all the work that you're doing. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate that um, my name is Amy Pisani and I'm the executive director of Vaccinate Your Family. I say this because the Facebook feed was a little bit, um, a little bit slow. And so I wanted to make sure um, that you feel welcome on our Facebook feed. We're happy to have you. Um, Sally Greenberg just spoke from the National Consumers League. I'm about to introduce um, some of our special guests today. Um, we have Dr. Stephen Hahn, who is the commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. I think most of you have seen him in the news. Um, it's pretty hard to miss. And we're very pleased to have him. He all, we also have with us Dr. Peter Marks, and I know Dr. Hahn will be introducing him. Um, and we also have um, on the line um, to answer questions, um, Dr. Char, uh, Rear Admiral Sharday Orojo. And so she'll be here to answer questions as needed. And we are also thrilled to have um, Dr. Amanda Cohn, who is the Executive Secretariat of the um, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices that's at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She's also the Chief Medical Officer of the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases, which I think most of you know 
is the Immunization Hub at the Centers for Disease Control. Um, so we're really thrilled to have all of our guests here today. I will mention just one thing. Um, first of all, most of you are pretty, pretty good on Zoom by now. I like to press the button that says um, speaker view at the top. It makes it a little bit easier to follow folks. And also we would love for everyone to list their name in the chat if you're on the actual Zoom. Even if you're on the Facebook page, we'd love to have you put your name in for the comments. You can then ask questions via the chat box. We will get to as many as possible. I have a few that were sent by email. You can also put questions in to the Facebook comments and we will get to those as quickly as we can as well. So without further ado, um, I want to introduce Dr. Han and I wanna thank you again for your willingness to go above and beyond to really reach out to the community and, and be willing to come on to so many Zoom calls to speak to us. Well, Amy, thank you very much. And I very much appreciate it. And the whole agency does the partnership with Vaccinate Your Family. I, I feel like uh, I'm gonna be sad when our regular conferences and meetings and stakeholder engagements end um, at some point as they should and will. And uh, Sally, great to see you again and to hear from you. We also appreciate the, the dialogue and the partnership with the National Consumers League, so, so thank you. Um, so really appreciate having this uh, call. We wanna discuss our COVID-19 vaccine process and we're very happy and want very much to answer your questions. Uh, we would appreciate very much that you help us disseminate the information that we give because that will uh, certainly help amplify the message that I think is so important at this time. And obviously timely, given the recent news of the Pfizer and Moderna emergency use authorization submissions over the last few weeks. And Sally, I think, you know, you highlighted one thing that's so important, which is that, you know, I think a very short time ago, no one knew what emergency use authorization was, even though it is something that um, Congress gave us and authority Congress gave us after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Um, I'm pleased to be joined today by my colleague and a terrific partner um, at the FDA who has done just an amazing job, uh, Dr. Peter Marks, an amazing job under some very uh, intense uh, circumstances in this pandemic. And he's the director uh, of the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. And that's the center that houses our divisions of vaccine that's in charge of reviewing and evaluating uh, any vaccine application that FDA would get in-house, as well as Rear Admiral uh, Charday uh, Arojo, who's the Associate Commissioner for Minority Health and the Director of our Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. And uh, Rear Admiral Arojo, Dr. Arojo, has been involved for many years in our intense efforts to make sure that we have um, um, health equity um, in everything that we do at FDA, but also partnering with centers like uh, CBER, um, and Dr. Marks to make sure that our guidance to sponsors, to manufacturers, to developers includes the very critical issues around diversity um, and inclusion that um, are so important so that our decisions at FDA are generalizable to all of Americans. Secondly, I was wanted to sort of thank all of you for your work in the public health space and your commitment. This is indeed a challenging time. And uh, Dr. Cohn, it's, it's great to have you uh, with us today. And I look forward very much to what you'll you'll have to say in your perspective because our partnership with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has been outstanding and your organization has done terrific work during this pandemic, so, so thank you. Um, so while we organize this call to provide an update to healthcare professionals and advocates about our work at FDA, it's um, really incredible for us to hear from you. So if you have feedback for us and other information, that's, we'll certainly take that back to the agency. Um, we've now been engaged for nearly uh, 10 months um, in, in combating the COVID-19 pandemic, and it has indeed been a painful period, no more than for the families and communities because it's changed how we live. It's uh, caused enormous uh, economic and social disruption, and, and worse of all, it's led to substantial personal tragedies. And, and, and personally, as a cancer doc, I, I've seen that in my career. I can only imagine but can't um, hope to know how, how hard that must be for everybody um, who's had to face that personally. And I just wanted you to know that that personal um, information, that knowledge of what's been going on in, in, in the community is something that is the forefront of our minds at the FDA uh, because we definitely recognize the importance of um, expediting a vaccine um, uh, authorization process but we also recognize that just as FDA does with all of its work, it's a balance. It's a balance to make sure that we do 
absolutely the right scientific review, that we use the rigor, and as Sally mentioned, the gold standard for safety and efficacy that FDA has been come to known for to be known for around the world. And we're not going to cut corners. And although Dr. Marks and his team um, have been working around the clock, um, Thanksgiving, the weekends, nights, et cetera, um, we realize that we must absolutely follow our processes and we will. And I hope you've seen in the press this week our ongoing commitment to, to doing that, um, despite what other regulatory agencies around the world um, are doing. FDA's North Star has been, will always do be the application of rigorous science and good data. That may not always seem the case externally, but I can assure you that all of our decisions have been made by our career scientists after assessment of data. Um, the EUA process, emergency use authorization, is one that uh, Congress gave to us after 9-11 to speed medical products. Um, it has a standard that looks at uh, uh, for a therapeutic may be effective um, and allows us to, again, assess the risk benefit, um, which does change during a pandemic. And my analogy is off, often a doctor in the um, emergency room who has limited data, but a life-threatening situation with a patient makes a decision in the emergency room, but updates that decision as more data become available. And that's the tactic that FDA has taken during this uh, pandemic with all of its emergency use authorization. Now, I think, Sally, you, you, um, you alluded to this, and Amy, you have done this on multiple times, but with an EUA or an emergency use authorization application for a, a vaccine, the risk benefit calculus, change, calculus changes compared to a therapeutic. We're not talking about the administration of a therapeutic for someone who's in the intensive care unit, for someone who has a life-threatening illness. What we're talking about is an application for uh, a vaccine that prevents COVID-19. So that calculus of risk benefit changes, and that's what led to our being very clear in our guidances about what we wanted to see. And Dr. Marks has been very clear to say that the criteria we're using for the emergency use authorization, clear and compelling evidence of safety and efficacy from at least one large randomized clinical trial, those criteria are not that different from what we would use for our standard approval process, what's called the BLA or biological license application. And, and, and with respect to safety follow-up, I'm sure you all know, we were very precise about the fact that we wanted a significant amount of safety data that was controversial and we've been criticized I think from lots of folks about this, that uh, perhaps we were too stringent or not stringent enough. And what our scientists did was use a very evidence-based approach. Dr. Marx's scientists said, hey, when are we gonna see the vast majority of significant side effects? In fact, the overwhelming majority. And we determined that the median follow-up in these trials should be two months for safety events. Knowing of course, what, what Sally said is that we will institute a very, very vigorous follow-up program to assess safety and efficacy after um, an authorization should that occur, should Dr. Marks and his scientists agree that that should be the case. We're committed to being transparent. We will have a vaccine advisory committee. Uh, those meetings were set at the time that we received the applications, knowing how long it would take for us to review the data. A couple of facts about that. Um, these applications, the Pfizer application, for example, has um, more than 44,000 uh, participants in clinical trials. Our are unlike other regulatory agents, our folks are going to look line by line in the data. We're going to do our own analysis, unlike other regulatory agencies. We're going to come to our own conclusions about the data, and we're going to try to answer questions around subsets of patients, racial and ethnic major minorities, pregnant women, um, pediatric patients, both with respect to safety and efficacy. That takes time. It's very important we do that. It's important on the medical decisions that will be made um, if there is an authorization, and that is something that we're committed to, to doing. I'm just going to end with the following, um, Amy. Um, the FDA will not, will not authorize or approve a vaccine for COVID-19 uh, unless we are absolutely sure that it meets our rigorous standards for safety and efficacy. And we will not authorize or approve a vaccine that we would not want to take ourselves or that we would not want our family to take. And what I can promise you is I have such faith, 100% faith in our scientists, that if there is an authorization, when it's appropriate for me to get the vaccine, I will be in line to get that when it's appropriate. Thank you. And that, now I'll pass it over to Dr. Marks, who I just want to reiterate has just been um, uh, terrific during all this. He and his center um, we just owe them a debt of gratitude for the work that they're doing. Thank you. Peter? Yep. 
Thanks very much. So uh, let me see if I can uh, get my camera on here. Um, thanks. So um, uh, just to, I think, I think the commissioner did a very good job of explaining uh, to everyone uh, the difference between uh, this emergency use authorization and uh, a uh, and a biologics license application, um, but uh, probably the, just to just to reiterate, um, the emergency use authorization represents a floor of what we can do in the event of an emergency uh, to make important medical products available. Um, I, I, on the other hand, what we usually expect from vaccines could be. Uh, considered like the ceiling of the room, we, we usually expect a very high standard of safety of our, our prophylactic vaccines, preventative vaccines. And uh, although we are using uh, the emergency use pathway to expedite the ability to get through the administrative pieces that are necessary um, and to be able to uh, have these vaccines come in probably before they would otherwise when we would need six or 12 or two years of follow-up. Um, we are not in any way uh, uh, undercutting the, the key effectiveness and the key safety findings that we need uh, to know that these uh, vaccines are gonna work uh, and that the great majority of uh, adverse effects would have been detected um, because those are usually found within about six weeks of vaccinations, 95% or more occur. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we'll have a very robust safety monitoring program in place, um, both of the people who are continuing on in the clinical trials, as well as in all those people um, who are going to be receiving the vaccine. Um, and that, that work will be done in conjunction with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, and we're quite happy to have an overlapping set of safety surveillance whereby there'll be the ability to have safety reporting spontaneously from people uh, reporting adverse events that occur to them, but also an active surveillance system whereby we will look to see whether people have interacted with the healthcare system around various things they may not have even realized may have been related to the vaccine, uh, but could have been related. So. I think we have a good program in place for this. The bottom line is that these vaccines that will be made available by emergency use authorization, although indeed um, they are not licensed vaccines, uh, we are uh, reviewing them, treating them um, as if they are very close to that. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Marks. Um, I believe that Amanda Cohn, are you set, Amanda? Dr. Marks, I have to ask you one question before we start, because I, I've been dying to know this. Who did the paintings behind you? And what does a lamb with a teapot mean? Uh, there's still life. My, my wife is an artist and these are early work from, uh, so yeah, there you go. So early works <laughs> on the wall behind me. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> seen those in a couple of different zooms and I've always been curious so okay great so Amanda are you all set I know you had to have shipped to another office because you have a meeting coming up so thank you so much yes no worries Amy I am here um I am not able to share my screen but I don't need to I can just give my talk without the slides if you prefer okay if you um just so folks know um, um Dr. Cohen has some great slides for us and we will share them with the folks who are on the call great. Um, and we'll also maybe put them on our website uh, when we when we put the presentation, um, the, the slides show up. So we'll put any slides that folks would like on there. And I know you had really helpful slides to share. So that's yeah. fine. No, it just it just says that the host has disabled the slide sharing. So somebody might be able to fix that. There you go, you're all set. Great. Okay. Wonderful, thanks. Great, can people see my slides? Mm -hmm. They're great, just put them great. into slideshow, okay. there you go. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Han and Dr. Marks, I think, um, uh, it is uh, an honor to come after the two of you as um, 
uh, CDC is often sort of the, I feel like it's the baton handing off from FDA to CDC as, as they put so much work into ensuring that these vaccines are safe and effective in reviewing the data. And then um, when FDA uh, feels they are in a place where they can be used, we take the baton and run with it. So um, I appreciate the partnership as well. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about how we are implementing vaccine, especially in the early stages, which I think is uh, what everyone's very focused on right now. Um, assuming FDA authorizes vaccines this month, uh, potentially two products that are under consideration right now, uh, we anticipate having limited doses available by the end of this year. Uh, therefore, we had to figure, ACIP had to consider which population should get vaccine first. Um, we do anticipate that, that doses of vaccine will continue to be available at an increasing rate over the next couple of months. And as we shift from a place where we have very limited constrained supply of doses to a place where we have ample supply of doses, we will also have to shift to um, making sure the people who are prioritized get it to ensuring really broad access um, across the uh, US population and particularly um, in high risk groups and in um, underserved communities. So the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices uh, used a, a framework that included evaluating the science, um, looking at implementation of these vaccines, uh, as well as looking at ethical principles. The ethical principles included maximizing benefits and minimizing harms, promoting justice, mitigating health inequities, and promoting transparency. The ACIP has been looking at this question um, really since June of this past year, knowing that these vaccines uh, were, uh, had very large rigorous studies that were moving forward very quickly. Uh, we have been having um, open, transparent public meetings about which group should be prioritized and in which order uh, when vaccines are available. So on Monday, ACIP uh, made their uh, first uh, group of uh, recommendations. And the goals of vaccination if supply is limited include decreasing death and serious disease as much as possible, preserving functioning of society, um, which is a really critical goal right now when we have a healthcare infrastructure and system that is, is really at maximum capacity uh, given the current surge in cases. Reducing the extra burden of disease is having on people facing disparities and increasing the chance for everyone to enjoy health and well being. Um, so, our goal is to have wide uh, and high vaccination coverage as quickly as possible. Uh, but we have to work in the constructs of the number of doses that we have available. So, ACIP on Monday recommended that the first two groups that should be considered for phase one implementation are healthcare personnel and uh, residents of long term care facilities. Now, a lot of people have asked, uh, who are these groups? Um, healthcare personnel is actually a very large group. We uh, estimate that there's about 21 million uh, healthcare personnel, uh, persons working in hospitals, long-term care facilities, outpatient uh, offices, home healthcare, pharmacies, emergency medical services, and public health. The definition for those healthcare personnel who should be vaccinated in this early phase are those healthcare personnel who have the potential to be exposed directly or indirectly to, uh, to COVID, uh, to exposed to COVID uh, either through individuals or through materials. So this includes um, the uh, individuals who come and clean out the emergency rooms in between visits, as well as the people who bring trays uh, to people in the hospital, as well as uh, all of the uh, people who care for our long-term care facility residents um, but it also includes primary care doctors who are taking care and hopefully keeping as many people possible as out of the hospital um, during this really challenging time. Um, we also estimate about 3 million long-term care facility residents. This is, um, includes about 1.3 million skilled nursing uh, facility, people living in skilled nursing facilities. And this is really where we are seeing um, an enormous burden of COVID um, in the patient population uh, and is uh, contributing a large number of hospitalizations and uh, deaths. So as we think about vaccinating um, that first 
21 million people in the U.S. Um, I, I want to say a couple of things before I move on to vaccine safety. Um, we um, know that about 30 to 40 percent of, uh, of healthcare personnel are, uh, are from communities of color. And so it is really important that we uh, vaccinate across the healthcare spectrum. We can't just vaccinate doctors and nurses. We need everyone who uh, is in the healthcare system to feel confident in the decision to get vaccinated. Um, and this leads us to, uh, as uh, Dr. Marx just talked about, really communicating our uh, vaccine safety process in systems that we have in place to monitor vaccine after authorization. Um, so one of the key strategies for us in the next couple of weeks will be to uh, ensure the public that the preclinical trials uh, have been quite robust um, and, have, uh, and have not detected any safety uh, concerns. But as we vaccinate millions of people over the next month, we are also watching as closely as possible. Uh, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System is a long-standing system. It's a partnership between CDC and FDA. And we call this our early warning system for vaccine safety. So any person who has an adverse event, whether or not they think uh, it is associated with the vaccine, uh, but if something occurs um, in a time period that uh, after vaccination where they think it could be associated with the vaccine, they report it to theirs. And this allows us to pick up on signals that then we can use um, additional systems to evaluate more fully. Additionally, because of the um, because of our um, continued desire to reassure the public and to really uh, make sure that we catch any potential vaccine signals very early, we're introducing VSAFE, which is an active safety monitoring for COVID-19 vaccines. So this is a smartphone-based monitoring program for COVID-19 vaccine safety. It will use text messages and web surveys to check in on vaccine recipients after vaccination. This is actually in some ways similar um, to uh, how you would participate in a clinical trial, um, but it allows participants to report any side effects or health problems after vaccine. And if a participant does report any side effects, they will get an active telephone call follow-up by CDC uh, for any reports of significant health impact. And that will allow us to ensure that people who um, do have health impacts after vaccination uh, will report those to theirs. Now, we do not anticipate that there will be um, ad serious adverse events. We know from the clinical trial that uh, there are um, uh, that there are systemic um, uh, adverse events or systemic side effects uh, in the first couple of days after vaccination, but those are mild and it includes things like um, feeling tired and having a headache and having a low-grade fever. Um, and, and most of those will, will go away very quickly, but we um, do want to make sure we capture um, adverse events and are doing um, everything we can, uh, both with our existing systems and augmenting in them with programs such as VSAFE. This is an opt-in program, so when uh, persons get vaccinated, they'll be given information. They will have to choose to be part of this program, but we really hope that um, the public uh, embraces this program. Um, as, as a way to uh, increase confidence and to make sure that we get all the data we need uh, to monitor vaccine safety. Um, as you all know, vaccine hesitancy uh, is a major concern right now for COVID vaccines. Um, I am really hopeful that as we roll out vaccines and people start to get vaccinated and have um, good experiences, uh, that we will start to shift um, the number of uh, people who are hesitant about getting vaccinated. Um, and, and vaccinating healthcare providers uh, first really um, helps uh, allows those healthcare providers to become uh, voices uh, for uh, recommending vaccine to their patients. So um, we uh, are really excited about um, uh, having the data reviewed by FDA and ACIP and and making that data public for people to see uh, uh, for people to see and uh, make a decision about getting vaccinated. We do have a national strategy to reinforce vaccine confidence in the U.S. Um, I've, I've really talked about the first two pillars of this. The first is to really reinforce trust um, through our regular vaccine safety monitoring systems and through uh, being transparent and reporting to the public. 
Um, the second is to empower healthcare providers, both to get vaccinated themselves as well as to recommend vaccine to their patients and their family members. 21 million healthcare providers who recommend vaccine to 10 or 20 different people uh, will, will capture um, most of the U.S. population. Um, so healthcare providers are really one of our, our, our major uh, sources of vaccine confidence. Um, and the last um, really important strategy, uh, which um, we need to begin now and to continue as vaccine um, becomes more available, is to engage communities in a sustainable, equitable way, using two-way communication to listen and to increase collaboration to build trust in COVID-19 vaccines. So our goal is to give partners and communities the tools that they need to promote vaccine confidence and to listen to their community and understand people's concerns. When we were doing some formative research that helped us develop the strategy, um, I frequently heard um, from, uh, from those living um, in communities that they didn't want to be told what to do. They wanted to, be, uh, they wanted to engage in a discussion and, and have their questions answered. Um, so uh, we want to engage community-based organizations, um, large national partners that have community presence, and we want to provide them with um, vaccine information in a way that, um, uh, in, in culturally competent ways and in ways that they can use to uh, increase confidence in their communities. So in summary, um, we absolutely know that there will be unanticipated challenges. Uh, CDC will continue to work closely with partners to find solutions and overcome these obstacles. Um, we really have to convey the messages additionally that vaccines are an important tool to control the pandemic, um, but it's not the only tool. And even once individuals are, mask are, are vaccinated, they'll have to continue to wear masks, socially distance and wash hands. Um, we call this the Swiss cheese approach. There are holes in all of these and we wanna make sure we, are, we don't have any holes. Um, and we really want to want to stamp, stamp off this epidemic as quickly as possible. And all of those will be tools um, to get us there. Um, we also just want um, people to know that our health departments are under immense stress right now. Um, they are implementing these vaccination programs amidst a huge surge in disease, strain on the healthcare system, and uh, after nearly a year of fighting this pandemic. Um, we rely on our healthcare partners to implement um, our national vaccine program. And uh, we uh, need the public and um, all of us to uh, do everything we can to support our public health departments. Um, and finally, we need to continue to lay the foundation to build vaccine confidence and to reassure the public um, that uh, these vaccines um, are very safe and we are continuing to evaluate vaccine safety and uh, will uh, act upon any um, any concerns that uh, the data uh, show uh, in in vaccine safety. So, I next slide. Oh, it's me. Um, that's uh, it today. Um, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, I do want to encourage everyone to go to our coronavirus uh, web pages on vaccines. We have a lot of information about. Um, explaining what mRNA vaccines are, explaining the ACIP recommendation process. Um, uh, there's a FAQ that explains a lot of questions that people have about vaccines. And as um, FDA reviews the data and we have information about the EUA, we will continue to add materials for healthcare providers, uh, the public and jurisdictions um, to uh, use as they uh, help support uh, getting this country vaccinated. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohn. So wonderful to have you here today. I know you're very busy. I know everyone at CDC is working their very hardest to get short, make sure this vaccine gets out as quickly as possible once they are authorized. Um, I'm going to allow questions from the um, folks who wrote in first. Um, I would prefer to have folks and ask the questions themselves. And so um, if you could do that, if you have a question and I have a list of names, if you could put your camera on, it always makes it a little bit more exciting to folks who are watching. So Dr. Jacobson um, from the Mayo Clinic, are you able to ask a question? I, yes, I thank you for um, this presentation. I'm, I'm camera, you want to look <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, um, my question is with regards to VSAFE, 
we'd like to create materials now um, for educational purposes. Um, but when we um, use the cdc.gov slash vsafe hyperlink, we get an error message. When we use vsafe.cdc.gov, we get a 404 message. It would really help us if vsafe was operational as soon as possible. Uh, thank you uh, for that question. I appreciate that. Um, the good news is, um, and I didn't include a slide about this, but um, Monday we were rolling out a healthcare system um, toolkit uh, for vaccination, which will include um, fact sheets and all of the information that you will need electronically uh, to promote be safe. And, and I really appreciate your promoting it. Um, I do believe that we have some information on the website and I don't know what's wrong with the link to the page. Um, I'm hoping um, in, we can find that correct link and send it to you. Uh, but Monday we will be sending out through all of our partners and um, I hope um, the Vaccinate Your Family team will send it out to um, their uh, listserv so that people have access to uh, these tools. It includes things like the buttons, um, and posters that you all can use, but it also includes information um, to talk to your uh, uh, healthcare providers and patients about be safe. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Cohn. And I think um, there's a little bit of confusion. I've heard a couple of people thinking it's an app. It's not an app, right? It's a texting system, but absolutely the education for providers, the sooner the better, correct? Okay. All right, I have another question. It's from Facebook, so it will not be a visual one. Um, here we go. So it says, I have a low functioning immune system. I have to move my camera a little bit. So I can read. I have a blood, I've had a blood test before and after the new and old pneumonia shots, which now would show an inefficient response. Can I be tested similarly for the protection I in fact received from the COVID vaccine? And this is from Joanne on Facebook. Um, and I'm here also at the meeting, Amy. Hi, Joanne. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Marks, you want to answer that? Do you have any insight into that question? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to try to, which is um, because there, I mean, this would be something for you to discuss with your provider, just like uh, for the pneumonia shot. In, in this case, one will be able to look to see if one has made antibodies um, after uh, receiving uh, the, the vaccines um, and uh, a provider would probably be reasonable to have that conversation. It's not something that to my understanding we would be routinely recommending, um, but uh, were a provider to be concerned about it, um, there are ways uh, to test for the antibodies following the vaccination. Also, do you know if adjuvant has been added as a booster to any of the vaccines? I was, uh, my immune system went into a storm after the second shingle shot. And what I was told that they think that it's because of the adjuvant that was added to the, to the second shingle shot. And it's a, sort of an ongoing keeps revisiting you uh, reaction. Yeah, so the, um, the, the, the first vaccines coming along do not have an added adjuvant. Um, the, there are future vaccines that may come along that might have an adjuvant. So it's probably important, again, to discuss with your doctor and to tell them the reactions you've had um, uh, so that you'll, they'll, they'll pick one that's appropriate for you. Some of these are absolutely free of adjuvants. Um, some will, um, uh, will potentially contain adjuvants. Thank you very much. Well, Dr. Mars, I'm going to stay on that topic just a little bit longer. And thank you, Joanne, and your husband in the background, my rotary friend. Uh, another question, Dr. Marx, would be um, the vaccination of those with a history of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Are you hearing, um, we're hearing that question quite a bit, and I wonder if you can respond to that. Right, so there's, the, there's been, always been this concern about, uh, because some vaccines are so have been associated with a slight increased risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, uh, to the best of our knowledge, with these first vaccines that are coming through, we've seen no association in the clinical trials with any Guillain-Barre syndrome. But obviously, there there that's not millions of people like we'll have surveillance on. Um, it's obviously a benefit-risk consideration. 
again, it will probably be a discussion with your healthcare provider about the potential benefits of being vaccinated versus the risks. But uh, uh, I would just say that more likely than not, your provider may say that the benefits outweigh the risks given what we know about these vaccines. But obviously you'll have to speak to your provider. And Amanda may wanna comment on that as well. Sure, uh, we will definitely be um, providing some clinical uh, 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 some additional clinical considerations um, and GBS will be one of the things that we look for very closely uh, as we do with all vaccines after vaccination. Um, and uh, we have uh, really robust systems in place to pick up um, uh, a potential increase in GBS. Um, typically our recommendations, uh, for example, uh, will, will, we will recommend for people with a history of GBS that they can be vaccinated um, until we have um, uh, until we have more data, uh, but um, we anticipate, honestly, with, with the good thing about being able to vaccinate so many people so quickly is we will have robust data um, in millions of people uh, very quickly and can assess potential risk from some of these uh, more rare adverse events such as GBS. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. And, and that is something the Vaccinate Your Family feels very strongly about. We've been spending most of our time um, pre vaccine approval, really talking about the vaccine safety systems that are in place in our in our country. We're so very lucky to have a robust system, several of them. And so I feel um, and my colleagues feel that um, any types of adverse reactions that happen, we will know very quickly. Um, and that makes me feel better about recommending it for myself and of course for my family, which I think is what um, what Dr. Um, Han was saying as well, you want to make sure that you feel comfortable before you tell everyone else to get vaccinated. So I think that's a really important message. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Rachel Tetlow from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists to ask her question. Thank you so much, Amy. And thank you for the opportunity to join today's call. Uh, we, we greatly appreciate this, this conversation. It's nice to see you again, Commissioner Hahn and Dr. Marks. I know I've asked these questions <laughs> repeatedly and appreciate you are he hearing me uh, again today. As you know, we are very concerned that pregnant and lactating individuals were excluded from vaccine trials. There will be lots of overlap between those who are pregnant and those who make up um, pr prioritized populations for vaccine access. For instance, pregnant individuals make up uh, a large of healthcare workers. We have concerns about the difficult position that, that this will put individuals and facilities in as they're making decisions. Um, can you share the latest on, on your thinking with regards to these populations? Um, and one more thing I'll say is that, you know, we, we are recommending recommendations for pregnant individuals and lactating individuals. And, and again, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And again, appreciate your attention to this important population. Amy, I'm going to let um, Dr. Marks ask, ask, answer the specifics, but one thing I just want to highlight, that's such a great question. Please keep asking it, Rachel, because it highlights why the rigor nature, rigorous nature of the data evaluation needs to take place. We need to go through line by line in these data. We need to look at these questions with respect to subgroups of people, those with comorbidities, uh, potentially uh, women who got pregnant after receiving the vaccine, uh, because these are critically important to our healthcare system and providers. So I'll pass it off, off to Dr. Marks, but it does highlight the need to have a very rigorous evaluation. No, that's that's right. Thank you, Commissioner. I think I think obviously there are women who became pregnant in the current clinical trials because there was no uh, there was no prescription in these trials against becoming. Uh, not becoming pregnant. So many, many clinical trials that are done with drugs, uh, uh, there are uh, contraceptives is, are required, whereas in these, uh, in, in these trials, they were not. Um, so uh, a number of women became pregnant and have been followed. In addition, there will be a pregnancy registry um, when uh, the, the vaccines are just deployed. So we'll have data from that. And in fact, with the Ebola vaccine, different, very different vaccine, uh, the way we got comfortable um, with uh, deploying that vaccine in pregnant women was through, not through a study done in pregnant women, but through the data that was obtained over time uh, with, uh, with, uh, with use in women who became pregnant or who were pregnant. Um, 
in, in this case, they, the companies are also going to be starting studies. They've, they've, they've told us intentions to start studies in, in those populations. But we will try to make a, as much as we can out of the data we have uh, to be able to get um, information. Lactating women, there'll probably be some discussion of that, and, and we'll see where, where we come out um, with uh, come out with on those because particularly for for non-virally vectored vaccines um, uh, there may be a, a feeling that uh, there there may be a, a spot of safety that after a period of time that uh, people are comfortable with so uh, more to come on that and that's why we'll as I think as Commissioner Han already said we're going to be carefully looking at all the data we have to try to make um, whatever recommendations we can. And those recommendations will obviously have to be refined with time um, uh, as, we, as we do. Um, and whatever recommendations we put on the label, then the, the Centers for Disease Control, ACIP, will potentially then uh, interpret uh, as well. Thank you, Dr. Marks. Okay, I have a question from Ms. Briggs from the National Association of City and County Health Officials. Hi there, uh, Eli Briggs, National Association of County and City Health Officials. Um, just thank you for all the great information. And I wanted to ask a question, I think this is for CDC on the VSAFE app. Um, it sounds like that's gonna be a really great tool for folks, but it also sounds like the information coming in could be overwhelming. And I guess you mentioned that CDC will be the ones responding to those um, inquiries, uh, will there, I guess one question is, will there be a connection then with the local health departments in the appropriate jurisdiction? And um, how, how will, are you all building up the capacity to respond to all those, those folks who are gonna be um, using that system? Thank you. So we absolutely have um, built up capacity uh, for call centers to uh, for a call center to uh, to do these additional calls. Um, I want to clarify that it's it's only significant health events that are reporting that we will be following up with um, uh, with the individuals about, um, and uh, we anticipate that. Uh, we will support that individual, and I, I, I believe the plan is that the individual and the healthcare provider will report to theirs, which does not usually come back to the jurisdiction in, in the same way um, that other types of uh, public health data uh, come back to uh, the jurisdictions. Uh, so our plan, however, is to um, provide uh, broad updates frequently about the number of events that are being reported through VSAFE, as well as um, the number of people who are enrolled and using it. Uh, we absolutely know that there will be health events that happen. When you vaccinate millions of people at one time, there will be health events that happen uh, in close timing after vaccination. Um, and so it is going to be, um, it is going to be incredibly challenging um, to uh, to evaluate and to sort out um, all of these potential signals that might come from VSAFE. Um, but we uh, think that it is the right thing to do uh, to evaluate more safety signals than, than to depend only on VAERS. And uh, we are working uh, very closely with uh, FDA and uh, have enough um, support to, uh, to rapidly uh, review that data regularly. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. Okay, I have a question that several folks have asked, and I, I know it's top of mind for many. Can um, either Dr. Han or Dr. Mark talk about uh, when we will be vaccinating children about, I know that they're starting to enter into trials um, in different companies for children. I think Dr. Mark, would be best to handle that one. Yeah, so um, let's, let's first of all define who's gonna get vaccinated in the first wave, uh, because, um, uh, so our definition of children in the United States includes anyone under the age of 18, uh, but because of the way the trials were conducted in uh, concordance with the European definition of child, um, uh, the, 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 it's very likely that any indication will be for individuals 16 years and older. So that doesn't help a lot. I know I'm, I'm, it's, like, uh, it, it's like splitting hairs perhaps, but 
um, will take two years more of, of being able to get down into the pediatric age group and the adult uh, in, in, in from, from the adult world. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the trials have enrolled, the Pfizer trial, for instance, did enroll um, a small number of 12 to 15 year olds. Uh, they have, they both, uh, the, the, and Moderna yesterday actually announced their plans uh, to uh, get a pediatric trial uh, going. Um, so uh, I think what we will see is very soon pediatric trials, uh, and they'll probably do the traditional way of studying uh, these vaccines would be to study additional patient, additional uh, healthy, they'll be healthy children in the 12 to 15 year old uh, age range, then go down to the uh, a lower age range, either five or seven years of age to 12 years, and then work down from there. Um, uh, that's, that is how um, uh, those trials will be done. The nice thing about those trials is they will likely not rely on clinical endpoints, but rather on uh, immunologic ones. So uh, they'll hopefully be able to get done relatively quickly um, uh, and we'll have an answer. Uh, but uh, we'll just have to wait for those to, to get done. They obviously, we have to be careful as we go down into younger children, because we know that coronavirus has a particular syndrome in children in which they get an inflammatory state. And we just wanna make sure that there's nothing we do with our vaccine uh, that might put them at higher risk for that. Thank you so very much. Uh, I'm gonna ask one more question. Um, I know we have more questions and I'm sure that our presenters would be happy to answer them and I can send them to you in writing. Um, this one question is talking about other countries. Are there plans to utilize safety data that may be derived abroad as well as domestically so that we can ensure um, that all of us in, around the world are safe from these vaccines that we're soon to be giving out? Yeah, this one, I, this is an easy question because we were on a call with our global regulatory colleagues uh, <laughs> earlier today and yesterday. Um, there are uh, very robust global efforts underway uh, to share safety information from these vaccines. Um, uh, there, this, was, this has been in place for previous outbreaks um, uh, and uh, will be done. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, uh, there's kind of overlapping efforts that we're, uh, that we're working through. Um, uh, so there will be tremendous amount of safety data sharing here uh, among different parties. Okay, thank you so very much. I am going to um, take the prerogative um, to share my screen with you. There are so many questions about COVID and we have put together a page. Um, Jennifer from Vaccinate Your Family has been working diligently on this page. Um, it will always be updated. It has um, different links to different pieces. It has FDA's page on here. We have WHO Mythbusters. We have the CDC's page. We also have a very robust um, Q&A section because as new vaccines and old vaccines are here, people always have questions and it's a good idea to ask questions. It's a, you're getting a, you're getting a medical product and we respect that you have great questions to ask. And so we have put in like all of the, some of the crazy questions, um, but also some very legitimate questions. But these are ways that you can also ask and answer your peers who may have heard a rumor about vaccines. And so um, please do come back and visit our page often we are out of time. Um, time flies when you're having fun. And I want to thank Sally for um, co-hosting with me. I want to thank our, our partners at the FDA and the CDC. We wouldn't be here without you. Um, we're, you're doing such wonderful work. And I know the nation is so excited that we're so close. If only it was polio, we'd be this close uh, you know, to eradicating this disease. But at least we're this close to having a vaccine. And, and I, I want to thank you very, very much for your hard work. I'm sure it's been a, a nightmare of a year for you. But we are so grateful to have you uh, really on that wall for us. So um, on behalf of everyone from Vaccinate Your Family, and I want to include our co-founder, Rosalind Carter, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to those on Facebook and Dr. Han. You're doing an amazing job with your team. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Sally. Y'all take care. Thank you. Thank you all. Well, it's a great session.